time. <laughs> so there's like, uh, so this is a really cool thing. This is I'm using Restream. So this will go out everywhere. I think I've got like 12 different pages lined up right now. So it's going to be people from all over watching, man. I'm really excellent. excellent. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Uh, you know who I am. I'm Ron Sparkman, and you even more so know the guy that I'm talking to today, the one and only Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, how's it going, man? How's life? Ron, dude, look at your shirt. I got, look, I feel bad. I don't have a shirt. I can't <laughs> hang with you. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> but I've got the cool background. You're the one standing in front of the, the Big Bang, so technically yeah. I think you got your feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, move your head just a big, see that the coattail blows up like... Yeah, I, the Big Bang would have been a little more severe on my circumstances <laughs> than just a puff of air on my coattail. <laughs> just, just, just a smidge. So, uh, just a smidge. And just so you know, this is not just any evening shot of the New York City skyline. I just want to make it clear. I get right here. Can you see that? So, for those that may not know, that is Manhattan Hinge, which I believe you're the one that coined that, weren't you? Weren't you the yeah, one? That yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, I visited Stonehenge. And it was very, it was an indelible force on my thinking ever since. And I wanted, I was jealous really, because if in the plains of, you know, South England, um, they've got these stones aligned with the universe. Hey, I got buildings and I grew up in New York. I, if you got stones, I got buildings, all right? So I wanted to find something that our buildings can do and I couldn't. So I said, let me just um, identify the day that the sun sets on the grid. And, and leave it at that. But now thousands of people pour off, pour out of their buildings, crowd the streets to observe Manhattan Hinge. So I'm very happy that we found a reason to stop traffic other than construction delays. <laughs> or a major movie like Tom Cruise run through the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, so, so let's kind of get dive into it here a little bit, and let's go with the first and uh, the first and most important question. Uh, how are you doing, man? How are you and your family? How's everybody <laughs> doing over there? Everybody, thanks for asking. Me? We're in the we're in the coronaverse right now, yeah, yeah. and uh, so uh, here with family, we are healthy and warm and fed, and um, we're we're waiting this out. But ideally, we we can still be sort of productive. My son is in college and he's taking classes. My daughter's a teacher and she's holding office hours by this multi-camera, you know, Brady Bunch mode. And that's an old reference. Half your people won't know that reference. <laughs> Just type Brady Bunch and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, the Brady Bunch was like a family of the eight of them or nine of them. And the show would begin, each one would be in a box at the beginning of the show. Um, and now that's what we're living with today. So thanks for asking. Um, we're healthy, and but continuing to monitor, continuing to be uh, cautionary in when we go out, uh, uh, you know, washing hands, following the advice of medical professionals. Uh, well, it's as you do. Uh, and uh, I think it's a really interesting thing that of all the times for the new season of Cosmos to come out, that would come out now. And Oh, my uh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Let's, everybody's home. And you want to understand what it is to heed the warnings of a scientist? Oh my gosh, every episode of Cosmos, we've got stories in there when people didn't heed the warnings of scientists and sort of people who study the problems that then confront society and even civilization. So yeah, it could have come out at a better time. And uh, it reminds me of the meme that goes around. It says, uh, at the beginning of every big, huge action destruction, world destruction movie, there's a scientist trying to tell everybody to pay attention to him and being ignored. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so we're just saying. Um, and so I guess you have to ignore scientists. Otherwise, you wouldn't have disaster movies. See? Exactly. Somebody's got to tell them what's going on first, or else it would just come as a surprise and everybody would die. You have to <laughs> heed the warning first so the really good looking people can run away. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Those are the ones you follow. You know, they leave exactly. the scientists behind. <laughs> There's the obnoxious good looking people. Let's follow them. <laughs> so, by the um, way, just, just in all fairness to good looking people, uh, <laughs> one of the great strengths of CSI. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, crime scene investigation, which has four incarnations, I think. There's the original and CSI Miami and CSI. Um, uh, I, and I don't know what the current state of that show is, but it had a very long run. It, it was... This guy. I, I, there you go. <laughs> there you go. He's got to put on his sunglasses. Okay. So 
So what you have are good looking actors portraying scientists mm -hmm. and, they, and they're solving crimes using their knowledge of physics, of chemistry, of biology, of medicine, of, and they're fully fleshed out in their characters. You learn, are they happy at home? Do they have kids? They have challenges. They, they're sad some days. They're real people. And that's where you have the foundations of storytelling. Not just the, the, just the, the characterless scientist in a lab coat, like you said, where the beautiful people run by, Doc, are we gonna live? Well, let me sit down and I'll explain. No, we don't have time, sorry. And so now the beautiful people were the scientists. And there was anecdotal evidence from college campuses that the enrollment in the chemistry classes, intro chemistry was up in the years that CSI had come on the scene. And especially that of um, uh, women taking chemistry and other STEM fields. And they linked that directly to the influence of CSI, just saying. I mean, I think it's... I think that these science shows, especially, so this actually is perfect because this goes into my first question anyway, is that, you know, the two things I've been watching has been Cosmos Possible Worlds and Star Trek The Next Generation. And they have something a little bit in common there with one of the storytellers and directors, oh, Brandon Braga. Yeah. So I thought that was a really, really cool thing. And he took on a bigger role this season than he did in the first season. So, um, so you're getting behind the scenes on this. You're you're reading the credit line. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm paying attention, for real. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, you know, this is a show that changed my life. It made me a science communicator. Like, I kind of pay attention to the details a little the, bit. The so. details. So <laughs> you're referencing Brandon Braga, who started out, he told me, as like an intern on this on this, on the set of Star Trek Next Generation and rose up and got, as apparently you can do in these, um, when you have these large productions that have a long tenure on, on the screen, you, you know the show, you can rise up and it became a writer and then a director. And one of his scripts got, got a, what's the award you get for science fiction? Um, oh. The, um, I should know this one as a sci-fi nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I think the OB Award, but it's not the OB Award. It's the Clio, not the Clio, that's with commercials. But you, all your people will know what I'm talking about. It's the highest award you get for science fiction storytelling. We got and, Google. Uh, so he, he earned one of those. And he was also a fan of Cosmos. And so in 2014. Hugo. Uh, the Hugo, Hugo Award. That's Thank it. you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you remember that or did you type that? No, I, I, no, I definitely went with Google. I had to go for my Google PhD on that one. Like, bam, I'm fast, man. It's my job. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, the Hugo Award. So um, in, the, in 2014, he was uh, one of three uh, co-writers on many of the episodes and he was director of the series. In 2020, he's actually a full-up co-writer on every episode and a and a director on many of the episodes, in some cases, shared with Andrean, who's hugely talented. Um, she's the she's the creative force. She's she's the torch bearer. Uh, My hero. My other of, hero uh, of Cosmos and <laughs> the DNA that it carries forward. The DNA that was hatched in 1980 with Carl Sagan. Count that as Cosmos One. Um, 2014 Cosmos Two. 2020 Cosmos Three. So. Uh, so yeah, this, these are highly creative, talented people. And Druyan, you're already a fan of her, so I'm telling you what you already know, but maybe your fans don't know. Um, she also wrote the book, Cosmos Possible Worlds, which is at, at Better Bookstores Near You. Yeah, um, it's very, very good. I can't recommend it enough. Most of bookstores anymore. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, she, though not a scientist herself, she is hyper-scientifically literate, and she she feels the universe. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. So that when you wanna tell a scientific story, she will figure out ways to express that information such that you are connected to it. I mean, think about the challenges you've always had in school. You go to school and there's a science lesson, you're not connected at all. In fact, you'd rather just be asleep. In fact, you regret even attending. All right. Whereas when Anne has the pen, it's, by the way, did you know that these atoms are part of your body and they came from this star and they continue and they'll end up in another creature? Say, wow, I didn't know that. I hadn't thought about it that way. 
So what she does is she animates the cosmic perspective in ways that you end up caring about it by the time we're done. And uh, I swear you haven't seen the questions beforehand, which makes it so funny because that was really my next question to kind of oh. talk about that. Um, Cosmos does the best job ever of putting, uh, you know, we had STEM, now we have STEAM. And Cosmos is the prime example of why the, the A matters in STEAM, the art. It's, you know, the music and the visuals. I mean, the way that, that Anne writes is, it's, it's poetry. Like, it's beautiful the way that she writes it and those mixed together. So, um, and I noticed it, you know, first in a space-time odyssey because, I've heard a lot of I had heard a lot of that stuff before, but when I saw it on screen and I heard those words, like there's you know uh, there's just so much and like that first that first fifteen minutes was what did it for me. That was it. I think what you mean is you yeah. knew the material before, but when you heard it expressed that way, yes. it hit you in another in a, in a whole other dimension. Yeah, I mean, I got chills again just remembering it, oh. and I've shown it to like a hundred people. You know, like oh. that first 15, 20 minutes was it. Once it got through, and like uh, whenever you do this, like feeling a little small, I was like, "Yes, I am. <laughs> this is this is awesome." It's like, what does that mean? Like thirteen point eight billion years? <laughs> I was like, what, what, what? Like it, it blew my mind. You know, it's so. Hold on, I got to do the thing. Okay, but um, <laughs> so I got to do the thing. But uh, I think that's one of the things that's amazing about it. So, how do you all, when, whenever the team is working together, how do you put together that wonderful balance of? you know, the sciences and the arts to make a show like this goes, man, that it just, it's a lot of work, you can tell. That's a brilliant question. And I'm disappointed with the rest of everyone I've been interviewed by for not asking that very same question. You are the first. Thank this, you, no. awesome. Okay, yeah. so you're badass in this regard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I can't think of a higher compliment, man. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Don't make me emotional. That's later when we talk about Cassini. Okay. <laughs> so um the I, I've always been a fan of the arts. My brother is an artist, and so I've been just exposed to that mindset, that creativity from very early. And our family would visit art museums often. Mm -hmm. Um my brother was I, I would get bored, you know, because I'm I was already leaning science but my brother would be totally engaged and I was intrigued by how he got engaged and um, to not just the art itself, but who painted it and what era it appeared and what medium was used and what was trying to be expressed and how we went from representational art to, um, to art that was uh, impressionistic to abstract, just the whole. So I feel more plugged in than I otherwise would be simply because we have art in the family. So now, when you step back and say, well, let's say you were going on a trip to Europe or anywhere, really, often half of why you're going on that trip, if it's a place you've never been, is you wanna see what art is there. What, what kind of art is, have they preserved? Or their architecture, or something about a culture that is long past that has been preserved. And what are we most likely to preserve? The structures and the artwork. Period. Okay, are you gonna remember which leader was head of what maybe, I don't know, but it's the art you're gonna remember. And so what that tells us is that the art is something more fundamental to what it is to be human. We all create art culturally and we preserve art and we value art. Okay, so now we now, we have science, okay? Science is an understanding of how the world works, the operations of nature. Now I wanna communicate that science to you. I could just hand you the science and you either get it or you don't, and then I move on. Well, then I'd just be lecturing to you. We wouldn't really be communicating. There'd be no conduit of communication established. But think about it. Think of the methods and tools that storytellers have used ever since we have been human, all right? Who, 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 the, the, the person around the campfire who told stories, people listen to them. You would sit there wrapped by them. If you go into a elementary well, school, if you walk into elementary school classroom, not everyone can do this, but if you can, you can have your kids sit around you and be wrapped by what it is you tell them. And they'll be, they'll be hanging on every next word. Why can't we bring the art of storytelling, the art of music that influences our emotions, the art of illustration? Why can't we bring that to bear on science communication? Why not? There's no law against that. 
because we've done it forever, telling fictionalized stories about the world, why not fold them in to factualized stories about the word, the world? I don't think that word exists, but you know what I mean when I use it. It does now. <laughs> Factualized <laughs> stories. So the collaboration of the cinematographer, the set designer, the costume designer. My clothing was designed by Ruth Carter. You know who Ruth Carter is? I don't. Okay, you're not looking enough at credits at the end of the Indeed, movie. indeed. I've only got so much time, man. <laughs> See, I'm so disappointed now. Okay, you gotta, yeah. you gotta earn this one back, all right? Okay. Don't Carter get... is the costume designer for the Black Panther. Film. Oh, nice. Okay. okay. Yeah. So clearly, I was like an, an easy gig for her because she's just dressing me, not yeah. whole tribes of people um, running up and down the countryside. But we, the, because of the legacy of Cosmos, we were able to attract highly talented people because we don't have the two hundred million dollar budget that you have for a first run movie. This is documentary budget. That's different. But so we've got the, the cinematographer who actually did star, star, um, a Stargate. He, he was the cinematographer for Stargate and he also did Independence Day, okay? These are people who've done big budget, big concept uh, things. And now they're bringing that talent to bear on science. So, and add that to the music, Alan Silvestri, okay? We know Alan Silvestri, he did, he did the music for Forrest Gump. He did the music for, um, uh, he's now uh, tapped for um, the Avengers series, okay? This is a busy guy. Mm -hmm. And he took a pause out of his schedule to compose music for Cosmos. So, yes, without the artistic talent contributed to this, you'd be watching a stale documentary like you have to take your medicine. Sit down, take your medicine, and watch this and you'll be tested on it later, and there would be no joy in Mudville. And uh, so I love it, the fact that you mentioned it, because the, the first couple of episodes um, I got to watch with um, Star Talk Mom, as I like to call her, Stacey Dev David Severn, which, of oh. course, you know and love. Mm -hmm. um, so this was, like, not too long after. Star like, Talk she... family, as are you. I, yeah. I count you in the Star Talk family. Just so oh, you know. well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. But, and it is, the party, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Bronze at the party, <laughs> surprise. You. <laughs> where do I have to hold a party where you you don't know where it is? Where's that gonna be? <laughs> <laughs> so, but we were so we got to watch the first couple episodes. Wait, wait, just just to back up so people will know, we uh, Star Talk used to have annual uh, holiday parties, and we'd invite some of our biggest fans to to that party. And, but we, I don't think we do that anymore. I have to check what the what the listings are. But um, so that's how I first got to know you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was uh, that was a really special day for me too because um, my mom had passed away a year to the day beforehand, and she got to see me fall in love with science, like because of this show um, and because of all those things. So it was uh, that was when I actually I was so nervous to talk. When I was in New York by myself for the first time in twenty years, I hadn't been there, and so I wrote you a letter. I was like, I'm not going to be able to talk to Neil. I handed it to you. You're like, No, you met me. Threw your arm on my shoulder. I was like, No, you met me. Met me. You can probably tell pretty easy you got to talk to him like so you just want to tell me no i can't i'm not gonna tell you man i can't tell you i'm too i'm too nervous <laughs> but stacy was um the person that was there her and her and elliot um her very talented son uh amazing photographer and science communicator of his own right and um so this was not too long uh, that we were we were actually talking about it. We were, it was, we got to watch the show and we noticed something we noticed that you're wearing turtlenecks and we had to we wondered Oh. Was that on purpose as an homage to Carl? Oh. I hope that it was because as soon as we saw, we were like, that's a Carl thing, man. That's got to be it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first of all, um, in my wardrobe, there's what I wear when I'm on the ship of the imagination. That's a black suit so that there's nothing distracting about it. And that way you can pay attention only to the imagery I'm presenting and to the words that come out of my mouth. Just a quick point about that outfit. When we were first imagining it back in 2014, I said, you know, shouldn't I have like a chevron or an epaulet or something? And Andrew and said, no, no, no. I said, why not? I'm commander of a ship. She said, she doesn't want anything between the viewer and me. Yeah. She doesn't want the viewer to think, oh, I guess I can't be head of the ship because he's got this, this uh, badge. Uh, and so as a result, we are together on that ship. And the ship is the expression of all the places and thoughts 
that the storytelling takes us. So that was a brilliant decision um, on her part. Now, uh, there's some other outfits I have, a very comfortable sort of academic tweedy jacket, and that's on top of a sort of a half turtleneck. It's not the full up 1970 <laughs> turtleneck. Not the uh, Carl Sagan version. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. Right. So it's, I, I, so it's a slightly lesser turtleneck, if you give me that. And it's not all the outfits, it's just one of them. <laughs> How many turtlenecks did Carl Sagan have? Billions and billions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just made that up on the spot. So you can take that if you want to. You can throw that out there. Uh, <laughs> so, the uh, Gary Larson comic. Um, as Carl Sagan as a child, he says, look at all the stars. There must be hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, we all look at that and we kind of say it like, oh man, and just to, to really kind of figure that out and look back, there must be hundreds. Just to, just to think about the fact that we all start somewhere. You know, we you all start have that, that point. The numbers point. before high numbers, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, let me, let me see where I was at here. Kind of, well, in a very good place. Okay. So this is, um, another great thing that you kind of mentioned too. One of the things that I love about the show before I had heard about the hidden figures book, um, which is kind of a, a really cool thing to me because I'm originally from West Virginia. And so is Katherine Johnson. In fact, I grew up five minutes up the street from where she went to college. So when I went home recently, I got to go see her new statue, which was amazing. Beautiful. Um, but there's just so many hidden that figures. Statue. Thanks for telling me. The, I, yeah, I, it's I, awesome. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yeah, it's in Dunbar, West Virginia. Well, I'm sorry, Institute, West Virginia. So I grew up in Dunbar like the first few years of my life. So this is a college I almost went to. Um, well, had I not, you know, that's a whole other story. Um, but, but it's- We're glad uh, you're back on track. That's what's Yes, good. yes, indeed. I mean, that's, I, I blame that on your guys, the, okay. the team over there. <laughs> take all the blame you can give us, good. <laughs> and I'm sure that there's plenty more like me. Um, but I love the hidden figures within the show. I think that's a really cool thing that there's these names that I'd never heard of. You know, when I went in, I didn't know who Faraday was, but by the time it was over, I'm like, Faraday's the coolest guy ever. How do you not know him? And I love that about the show, that it's really big on taking these names. Um, you know, Cecilia Payne, we actually did a really cool thing last year about different science communicators. And the first one, um, my friend Copy Rose put it together for Fun Fact Science was, let's talk about the women that were in that, that were in that one episode. And it was just really, really cool thing. I'd never heard about them and how many people know about them now because of Cosmos. And there's yeah, a lot of those a, in this new season. Thanks for pointing that out. Again, that's a, it's only occasionally reflected upon, but I think it, we should, I should hammer it home right now is um, if you look at most history books of science, there's the greatest hits, Newton, Galileo, you know, and then, but wait a minute. Wasn't science more than just their work? Were there other people working behind the scenes? Are they under-recognized? Did they make a single contribution that others, um, that advanced other people's ideas that would not have been possible without it? So a, another dimension of cosmos is not just the seamlessly blended chemistry, physics, geology, biology, uh, and astrophysics, but also history. And you're right, hidden figures now in the meta sense is almost every person we profile in Cosmos is a hidden figure of some kind. Someone you probably hadn't heard of, but you'll be glad you did. And like you said, now they're like the most important person ever. I want to learn more and more about them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew what Cassini, I, mean, I knew what the Cassini mission was. By the way, the ending of the Cassini episode, too soon. Thanks for making us all cry again. We just oh. got over it. <laughs> but no, I love that. I, like, I didn't know who that was. I really didn't. I still had never thought to look the name up. And then when I watched the episode the other night, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And cool. Like, I know Huygens because we have the Huygens probe. Well, we had one, uh, a version of it um, at the Discovery Center, the museum that I'm at now, Space Foundation's Discovery Center. And um, so I knew about that, but I never knew who Cassini was. So it was like, again, right, like, right. It's still so yeah, because what happens is these, these just become the names of space probes or the names of telescopes. And, and they become bigger as a name of an object than they ever were as the name of the person after whom the object is labeled. So today when I, when I'm writing and I talk about Hubble, I have to specify Hubble the man because otherwise people's first thoughts are the Hubble telescope when I'm referring to his historical contributions. So, so uh, that's right. And in case no one knew our space probes, um, many of the space probes are named after scientists who have contributed material materially 
in our understanding in the topic or at the destination of that space probe. So Cassini did a lot of work regarding Saturn's rings and the Cassini space probe went to Saturn. We had a space probe that went to Jupiter. Jupiter's moons were first understood with Galileo. That space, pro space probe was called Galileo. And so um, this has been a habit of ours. Um, and we've had telescopes called Einstein, Chandra for Subrahmanyan Chandra Sekar, who pioneered our understanding of black holes. Um, there's a Spitzer telescope. This is a Lyman Spitzer. He was alive in my lifetime at Princeton. He first proposed the idea of a space telescope. There's a whole, if you just went down the list, it's a history lesson. And we do this very on purpose uh, so that these people are not forgotten um, as we go forward uh, in for the future history of science. And, um, I, I think this is really kind of an interesting thing too, because when I started going back to school, you know, finally got my GD, started college classes. My most interesting class um, was from uh, my professor, Justin Burnett, who has become my friend since then. And he was my history professor. And I mean, dude, he's almost an order on the level of like you, like I, I, we, the class was a, an hour and 15 minutes long. And I would often stay an hour to an hour and a half after just to like, keep picking his brain on stuff and i would it, constantly it, hit him and like i need a source better. for that and he's got this crazy memory he's like it's from this book go check it out here it's awesome There's nothing more enlightening yeah than being in the company of an enlightened historian yeah oh my gosh yeah Talk he's about he still does it to me. a body of knowledge but a body of context mm -hmm. and to just make you think about things that rather than, again just hitting the greatest hits or this king or this queen or this war or this battle but what was going on? And they have that deep insight. I love picking the brain of historians. I'll do that all day. <laughs> it's a fun one. And I love it because, you know, I learned kind of about different trailblazers and names and things about people, details of people about people that I didn't know. And that's one of the reasons I love this. I love the fact that, you know, in the first season, like, I knew who Newton was. You know, I'd seen like, the video, uh, I think like one of the ones that you did on Big Think where you were talking about how he was your favorite guy. But I loved in the show where we found out that he was just not – not the nicest person um but that was that was interesting to me it's like it doesn't matter kind of in that sense if like who, for whatever reason he was a he was a recluse and all this um but it's what he did with the science that matters you know hook that, was a good thing not about a good guy science. but yeah we can honor someone's let me not use the word honor we can fully respect a person's scientific contributions even if they were assholes okay yeah yeah, yeah. But period yeah. Um, and so we can separate that. We live in a time now where if somebody doesn't like one thing about you, then they've decided they don't like all of everything you otherwise represent. And that's very factious in our world. It's very tribal. Every, everything about you has to match everything about the other people who then want to embrace you. And that's not the way a pluralistic world works. It's not how it's assembled. So... Uh, it used to be you could be friends with people who voted in ways that you didn't vote. That's somehow that's no longer possible. Um, and I, I don't know what the future of this is, but I do feel like it's a regressive step because we know we came up in tribal circumstances, all right, for survival, for whatever reasons that it mattered 10,000 years ago. But now, no, we're in a global economy. We're in a global society. The coronavirus didn't have to show a passport in order to go from one country to another. It just moved. Same with air molecules, same with water molecules. One country's pollution is the world's pollution one, of water or of air. One country's contagious disease is the world's contagious disease. So yeah, we gotta learn how to uh, outgrow that, I think. And uh, I think it's good. I think it's a great point too, um, especially because I know you just did you did a masterclass live last night, right? Correct. Oh, we, it was it was a um, it's a new thing they're doing. I think it was inspired by the the coronaverse, uh, mm -hmm. where they get their instructors for the masterclass, and then they, there's a live uh, Q and A mm -hmm. about the class or just about anything that uh, people are curious about. So yeah, that was just a couple of nights ago. Um, so we found this funny. I was talking to one of my really good friends early. Or, uh, her name's Kathy Kerners, big space nerd. And somebody had sent her a ridiculous video on astrology. 
and the master class for you popped up at the beginning oh. as like you might you might not you might know enough about something to think that it's true but not know enough to know that you're wrong and i just cracked up we <laughs> laughed about that all morning this morning <laughs> so uh, i love the fact that there's still we've got people um not just like you but so many other people um emily calandrelli um you know uh like diane cowan like all these people that are social media and um um, like TV shows and stuff that are science communicators that are so big on social media, which is really cool for me to kind of somewhere in the bottom end be a part of that, of what these amazing people are out there doing. And I think that it's important that we have those kind of voices that can say, like, I can disagree with you, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation about this because that's how we haven't come to a happy medium. We probably have more in common than we have, you know, th th that we disagree on. So uh, I, think, I think, that, think that is, I think it's a really important thing. My analysis of that is I think we've lost sight of all that is objectively true in the world. And you have people arguing vociferously over things for which there is really only one answer, or there's an answer that does not always agree with opposite views. So uh, yeah, I, maybe something in the education system needs to change. Uh, I'm still thinking that through and I might publish something on that in the future, but yeah, we, need, we, have, a, we have a long way to go. If, if as a civilization, we are to survive ourselves. And yet you've got to be willing to, I think that was the big thing. It took, it was a hard left for me to go from, uh, there was a bunch of things I believed in when I first started that very first episode of Cosmos, like the first one, I mean, of the, of the last season. And so I went into it and I believed in God and I thought aliens were crazy. And within an hour it flipped. I'm like, there's definitely alien life out there and I'm not so sure about God. And that was like, that was a really crazy hour for me. <laughs> but that was not the intent to, to yeah. disavow you of your, um, uh, but what happens is if you're confronted with what is objectively true, if you have been cloaked from those objective truths throughout your life, um, it can be alarming eye-opening uh, for some, disturbing, because they're, what they believe to be true can be such a strong foundation of their definition of themselves mm -hmm. that it can be highly destabilizing. It was. It was rough. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a little painful. Like I lost my mom about a month and a half after I had my crisis of faith. Yeah. That's a weird thing to put together. Yeah. Like how to kind of reconcile those two things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, about 70% of Western scientists uh, uh, even in the physical sciences, would claim to be religious. In a, and so being a scientist does not preclude you being religious, but being a productive scientist will preclude you from declaring non-scientific things that you might get from your holy books, right? If you require that the entire universe was created in six literal days, then there's a, we have an issue with that. That's not mm -hmm. reconcilable with observations and experiment. And so it's the people who, enlightened religious people have no problem with science. It's the people who have, who require of their worldview that every word that appears in their holy books is literally true mm -hmm. and not figuratively true or poetically true or, or poetically metaphorical, they, there's a subset of religious people that require it be literally true. They will have problems with scientific discoveries. The rest of the religious community, I don't see them having problems with it. And uh, I mean, you all use some really amazing tools on the show um, that I think are what kind of, what turned me around. The big one was, the, the one that did it for me, and I, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, was both of them were in the first episode of the first season, and they're still here in this one, is the cosmic calendar um, and the your cosmic address. The cosmic address is the one that got me. I'm like, oh, cool. And like, I'm realizing, like, okay, we're, we're out of our solar system. We're in the Milky Way galaxy. We're in some other galaxy. It's like Virgo supercluster. And it just keeps going. Yeah. Um, just to be able to utilize those tools, you use them in very interesting ways in the first season, which, or I'm sorry, the second season that blew me away. But then you, especially because with Anne being involved, they're, they're kind of turning their head in some really cool ways in this season. So, what is it about those tools that just are really eternal? Like they, they work for Carl, they work for Ann, they work for you now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, what is it about those? Some of it is empirical. You know, you test some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit next to someone in an airplane and they find out, you're, this is before I was recognized as I am, people would say, oh, what do you do? I said, I do astrophysics. And then out come the questions, right? 
is there alien life? Is how big is the universe? What's around before the Big Bang? Is there God? Right. So you you have this sort of empirical record of what questions and what answers most resonate with people and what analogies people brighten when they hear. And so a lot of this is the trial and error of, of the life experience encountering curious people. And so a cosmic calendar, it, it turns out I have a mild issue with the cosmic calendar, but the issue is not strong enough to override the benefit of it, okay? The issue is as time progresses in a billion years, that calendar doesn't continue. Yeah, that's okay. I, that was going to be my thing with it. I'm like, if that's what I'm saying. Gonna, yeah. Right. It yeah, yeah. stops at midnight on December 31st. So what's happening is you're cramming more time into the year at a glance calendar. So you have to explain that if you ever get to it, is my point. Okay. So it that last moment of that day is always the current moment. That takes a little more explanation. You can sort of dust over it um, initially because the bigger point is, look how big 14 billion years is compared to the human species. That's the bigger point and that's the point that's conveyed. So it, it's not a perfect analog for the reasons I just stated, but it's a really, really good analog worthy of investing the computer graphics and the visual effects to, um, have it come alive in front of me as I interact with green screen. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I'm learning green screen and that is, I, I almost threw my computer out the window. I started learning it last weekend because we're doing a bunch of video stuff. Every platform's digital now. I'm the digital guy. So I'm getting to learn a lot. Of, I like a lot of these things I really wanted to learn and green screen is maddening to learn. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But okay. um <laughs> I do love it. And I kind of, um, I've kind of thought about it too, but you know, in the last season where you see it and it flips and you start looking into the future about here's what happens, here's what happens if we change things. So I was kind of wondering is, you know, do you kind of see maybe the, um, the next, like the next part of the cosmic calendar, like the next year starts when we figured out what we're doing with, um, you know, like with, with climate science and we've become a space faring species and like our next evolution tomorrow of uh, um, maybe Star Trek kind of paradigm a little bit. That's kind of the way I always kind of viewed it. I'm like, maybe that's when we say it's the next calendar year. Yeah, when so we've it will take, it will take an, a cultural evolution, um, yeah. not biological. It's not clear how you would do this biologically. Definitely cultural. We've had other cultural revolutions. For example, um, uh, what's a good one? Basically, while there's still some secret pockets of the world that sustain slavery, there is no modern country that endorses that activity in the world, okay? Like I said, even though there's some back, you know, behind the scenes things going on, there are no doctrines saying this is our policy as there was for centuries, okay? In the advanced and modern world. So it is possible to evolve a culture, I think, but it's slow and people don't give up power easily. People don't give up their habits easily. And so if we are to go forward in ways that we become wise shepherds of the civilization we are bequeathing to our descendants so that they are not embarrassed by what we have done to the world, but proud of it. Yeah, we need to think no, not all oh, the world is going to end. We're all going to die. Let's be creative. And in the last episode of Cosmos, leading into it from the second to last episode, episode 12 and 13, it's all about the future. It's all about imagining, you know, I'm old enough to remember the New York World's Fair, 1964, because that's how old I am. And so much of that World's Fair was given unto imagining a future. And it was a future enabled by science and technology and you knew it with the monorails and the you know not all of it would come to pass but it, that doesn't matter what matters is that there were people thinking about it there were people trying to invent the future we were imagining and you know who else did that in 1939 world's fair and guess who attended that at about the same age that i attended the new york world carl sagan 
I know that because I've seen the episode, but for those people that haven't seen it yet, because I got the advanced one, and that was one of the coolest things in my life, by the way, to get the advanced episodes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carl Sagan was five or, yeah. uh, or six when he visited the 1939 World's Fair. Also a, 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 also a love letter to the future of culture and civilization, not entirely realizing that we'll descend into six years of carnage from the Second World War. Um, but there were glimmers of hope that would be resurrected at the end of that war. That, and you can see the seeds of it traceable to the, to the thinking that was going on in that 1939 World's Fair. In the 13th episode, Anne Julian didn't go unnoticed by her that both Carl Sagan and I were touched by the futurism of World's Fairs. And she said, let's imagine a World's Fair in the year 2039, a hundred years after the New York World's Fair. Okay, so first you have to imagine what life in 2039 would be like. Then you have to imagine the future that they'd be imagining, right? Yeah. So it's a double nested projection of what our science and technology can do for us to get us out of the muck and mire that we have steeped ourselves into from greed, from selfishness, from, from warmongering. All of this does not bode well for the future of civilization in the way we want to imagine it. Again, so that our descendants are proud of us rather than embarrassed by us. So there's a lot of future thinking that went on into that episode. And I, I, I mean, it was, I, I didn't see it all until it came together I mean, I'm in it, of course, but you know, to see all the graphics and uh, visual effects to come together, it's like, whoa, yes, that's exactly what I want to have happen in 2039. It reminds me of, uh, so one of my friends from work, Matthew and I are huge fans of a little scene or a little loved movie from Disney called um, Tomorrowland. And Tomorrowland, that's the whole idea that like uh, George Clooney's character went to uh, you know, one of the World's Fairs and then they picked him up, this group of geniuses that had created this other place where scientists could just, you know, go nuts and do everything they wanted to do. And I always, I love that idea of a place where everybody was focused on it, not saying we have all these issues, we can't solve them. We have all these issues, we can't solve them. I'm just like, how do we fix it? Right. How, how do we do that? And I love that Cosmos does that. Like, I wasn't, I well, wasn't, keep rejecting. Fear, I didn't, the fear wasn't placed in me to understand climate science. I learned about Venus first and was blown away by the fact that it can happen without us. And then 45 minutes in, it's like, here's the same kind of thing that we've got here. And thanks to this person, this scientist who saw it, we know that it's happening. These scientists have seen it for over a hundred and something years. I didn't walk away with it being like, I'm terrified. I'm like, oh, I understand the science of that. Now Hopeful. that makes perfect exactly. sense. Yeah. Exactly. And, and if anything is a hopeful person. I tend to be more sort of real, a realist, not a pessimist. I'm realist leaning hopeful. She's, she is a optimist to her bones all, all the way. And you need that if you're going to take the viewer to a new place, such as where Cosmos takes you. Um, I got two more if you got time. You still got time? Let's do it. Let's do it. Only okay. for you. Huh? Only for you. Only for me? Okay, awesome. Well, awesome. Uh, this one's actually pretty quick, but this is when I thought of something you would think was pretty amazing. Um, so before we hopped on on this call, I was talking to one of our volunteers, and he used to work on, uh, it's Lou uh, Ramon, and he used to work on Apollo 11 as an engineer. And when I was talking to him, and he knew that I was going to interview you today, he was like, tell him how amazing even an old fogey like me thinks that he is and what Cosmos is and all of that. So you're not just touching the people of like the, the younger people, maybe the people of your generation, but even the people beforehand that were putting people in space, that's kind of a big thing for you and the team to kind of, you know, to be behind. And it's something I got to say too, when I watched the first season, I went in not knowing these things, but what I love about the new season is, is like, I feel if I saw the new season, I'd be equally as blown away, but now I'm excited about it. I hear the one about, it's like this guy walks out and I forgot what his name was. He walks out and sits underneath uh, and he looks at this star and he notices that it's dimming. And I'm immediately like, it's an exoplanet episode, <laughs> you know, cause I know what it is now. But it's, it's equally as interesting to me now being in the world. And that's what I think is amazing. It can touch, you can be a kid that knows nothing. You can be 70 and know nothing. You still connect it with everyone. And that is a really, really big thing to do. And I don't know how that's even possible. I don't know how you guys do it. Yeah, well, it's a, um, it was on purpose, right? It was not an accidental fact that 
there is messaging in there for people of all ages. And that's such a cliche saying, oh, for people of all ages. Usually that means it's for kids, right? When somebody says that. So um, let me just say something that we noticed in Cosmos 2014, and we're still waiting for the data on Cosmos 2020, but it was a show where it came on just at the time we would be putting your five-year-old to bed, right? It's eight o'clock, go to bed. Grownups are gonna watch TV. And what happens, your five-year-old can't go to sleep and they come wandering out with their, with their plush toy. And then they look over your shoulder and they notice you're watch, watching Cosmos and they're interested in it. Now you can't send them back to bed because it's, it's a learning experience. And so they hop in the couch with you and everyone watches it together. So Cosmos 2014, was a resurrection of multiple generations experiencing the same media at the same time on the same platform, as opposed to people uh, uh, scattering to their rooms with a, with, with a tablet. So for it to become a family experience event, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for that because you can talk about it together, you can experience it simultaneously. And so, um, yes, there's something in there for at all ages and at no time are you bored by something that would more excite someone else. I think it's all works in as a tapestry. You're embracing the, the, the entire tapestry, not absorbing it in just pieces, waiting for one piece to end to get to the other one because it's all connected. I love it. And that's, I mean, this is a perfect way to uh, wrap up with a final question too, is that um, with, with this show, with uh, the stuff that you do with your, um, um, with traveling around the country and talking to people at your events, like uh, astrophysicists, ghosts, and movies, star talk, all this, you were known for giving some pretty uh, deep, important words, these mind blowing things for people. And now is the time when people need some motivating words. Like, is there anything like in particular at this time, like maybe like, I know you can pull this stuff like out of a hat at any given time, which is amazing. But uh, <laughs> so is there any advice that you have for folks that are just, you know, dealing with a lot right now? Like maybe the importance of science, anything like that? Yeah. Um, viruses don't care what your nationality is or your skin color or your politics or your religion, or your sexual preference. It doesn't care. We have hard earned tools, methods and tools of science, specifically constructed to handle situations such as contagious, uh, contagion, viruses. So if there's ever a time we need to come together as humans, because we're all the same species and this virus is attacking our species. This coronavirus episode is the closest thing we've had to an alien invasion threatening human life on earth. It's a dry run. How are we all going to respond to this? And I, I don't know how well we're doing. It, it looks like we're doing like a C minus on the report card, as far as I can tell. There are pockets that are doing well, but otherwise um, we should be glad it's only a virus we're fighting and not some completely weird new thing that we don't know anything about. And oh my gosh, how are we gonna handle this? So what that means is at some point, you're going to have to listen to medical professionals and scientists and other experts. Oh my gosh, I use the word expert. You know, is that okay? Is, is it okay to be an expert in today's times? Or are you just going to say, I choose not to listen to you because I don't want it to be true. That's not, a, that's not the foundation of a strong society. That's not the foundation of, of an informed democracy. That's the beginning of the end of the unraveling of everything we have built in this modern civilization. So sorry, it's not pithy, but it's true. <laughs> so what you're saying is, is that 5G 
absolutely caused the coronavirus. <laughs> okay, just let me <laughs> Um, Neil, uh, listen, man, um, I'll try and say this without getting emotional. Um, six years ago, this, this show changed my life in a direction I never thought that it could, could or would go. Uh, I often get really cool messages from people that um, are the platforms that I work with have, have helped them or inspired them or I've inspired them in some way. And I would not be who I am now without the show that you all created. Um, and for the, the person that you have always been whenever I've met you, you've always been super cool. And it's always been, um, it's disarming how, how open you are to talk to people and be in conversation with people. Um, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I know we went way over. Thank you for having just a really, really awesome conversation. I know that my social media is losing its mind right now. I can't wait to read. What I saw last time 15 minutes ago was 125 comments on my personal page. Okay. I can only imagine what it's going to be once I get back. So All right. thanks, man, for what you guys are doing. And if you need a co-host for season four, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron, just stay strong and stay stay ambitious, stay curious. Uh, all of those are key ingredients in growing in this world. You don't want to, you never want to sort of stagnate. Just if you remain curious, you'll always ascend that next run in the ladder. And if you stay that way, you realize one day you, you look around and say, oh my gosh, I'm up high on this ladder and I can see where I've never seen before. Oh my gosh, I can help others. Uh, and so that's what you're doing. And uh, you're one of the success stories of this world. And unfortunately, there's not enough of you out there. But maybe with, with your program and others, uh, we can get we can clone your, your story. Maybe so. Hey, man, maybe I get to be one of the uh, the hidden figures someday, in like season three, <laughs> like 136. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. You guys right. have a great weekend. Um, I'm going to go play Final Fantasy VII Remake and uh, then You're watch back. this back because I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I'll see you later, Neil. Thank All you right. so much, man. Thanks. Bye.